yeah, welcome back to the digital main stage, basically. Um, I hope you've had inspirational breakout sessions, uh, and I'm really looking forward to hear more about what uh, you've discussed. Um, I think, um, yeah, all of you um, worked on a slide as I'm informed. Um, so I would like to, yeah, maybe we can first look at the different slides and then I would like to hand over to the moderators of each breakout session so we can hear a little bit of what you've discussed. And then afterwards uh, we will have, yeah, 40 minutes uh, time for the last, session of uh, today um and yeah i mean like because of that i think the, the time management in your presentations now is really crucial so please limit yourself to two or three minutes and then it should be ideal okay then um yeah i think uh the slides will show up in just a second um but i think we will start with ah there there we go okay that means we will um but i think we'll start with the role of interpreters who's the moderator did you prepare something or should we jump to the next one? Birsen, are you there? Okay, then uh, let's start with uh, the holistic approach. Maybe that was also on the live stream. Um, Mina, can, are you there? So can we go forward with you? You are muted. There we go. Now, perfect. sağlığı ve psikososyal destek hizmetlerini tartıştık. Ee, ana, yani oturumumuzun ana e, tartışma noktası aslında e, her iki merkezde sunulan benzerlikler ve farklılıkları görmekte. E, e, Türk Kızılay tarafından sunulan hizmetlerde e, bütüncül bir yaklaşım e, bağlamında koruma programı, sosyoekonomik güçlendirme programı, sağlık ve psikososyal destek programı bir bütün halinde one stop shop so it's a one-stop shop and uh, people's needs are identified on the field and then the program staff if it's a problem of a child uh, attending school then the child development specialist talks to the family if it's a problem related to development then the uh, development specialist is uh, uh, in charge of this. Or if it is a problem with respect to having access to rights, then uh, the case specialist take care of it. If it's a single parent case, then if it's a household uh, managed by a woman only, then these people are offered uh, trainings uh, to empower them, to include them into social groups. So related programs uh, pro uh, collaborate. In, in uh, the presentation made by Nicola uh, on uh, Center of 11, there are social service specialists, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists 
approach uh, things with a uh, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, there are psychotherapy uh, services for outpatient uh, outpatients, and there are day clinics. There are also services offered to meet the needs of uh, a woman. There are also uh, services offered by Uber Leben uh, that focus mostly on uh, people who have been subject to violence. There is a social service network established uh, in Berlin and they are in close contact with them. Uh, there are uh, trainings, uh, courses offered uh, to make sure that they get a job and they test uh, different tools, they document them um, the victims of um, torture in order to make sure that they can apply for the refugee status. They uh, also prepare documents for courts. Iraq, uh, Syria, uh, Afghanistan and Chechnya are uh, the most uh, are the uh, countries from which they receive uh, refugees and mostly they come from Syria. Only a very few of them come from Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, yeah, then, um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, please try to limit uh, the presentations now to really like the two, three key points uh, for now. Um, so, um, Ursen, Serinkus, on the role of interpreters, are you ready now? Uh, yeah, hello. Hi. Yes, hello. Unfortunately, I could not prepare a PowerPoint presentation because I had a pro technical problem and I was fighting to be reconnected. I will try to make a summary of this in two minutes. First of all, we spoke about the role of the interpreter during a psychotherapist um, therapy and how uh, one is dealing with the um, challenges and needs of that uh, situation. We spoke about the tripartite constellation within the therapeutical structure, uh, the fact that the interpreter is a third party, a foreign third party, and in that context we spoke about the responsibility of the interpreters in their role as uh, transporting the um, feelings and emotions of their the role they have to fulfill taking care of those refugees just arriving we spoke about the um, impacts on the interpreters when they work and uh, have to translate in such complex situations there are differences uh, miss al sharif who works uh, in Germany and is uh, translating psychotherapist sittings with Syrian refugees, has different experiences than Mr. Mahdi, who himself had to um, live these kind of experiences of being a refugee. And uh, so this has also a different impact on the way how one is feeling as an interpreter. And at the end, we had a question which basically summed up what we are doing, what we need what kind of future perspective the question was about what kind of uh, what kind of specific qualification or qualific qualification and further training one needs to fulfill the needs on the level of translating and transferring but at the same time to take up the responsib responsibility how to bear the responsibility and how to deal with this kind of social and uh, impact one has because translating means that we are dealing with individuals who have to deal with their own situation who has to uh, develop their own lives and who are uh, need need to uh, to develop based on the therapy uh, their new lives and as for the interpreters we spoke about the question about the supervision for interpreters as an ex specific training uh, and to also deal with certain situations one has to fulfill uh, as an interpreter 
and also qualifications uh, which uh, are further trainings which should be aimed at subjects like competence as interpreter, expertise, competence, expertise, uh, language, uh, technical uh, terms, and also methods and methodologies in the therapy to be dealing with exactly these kind of challenges and to be able to understand. We also spoke about empathy, the necessity of empathy, uh, the question if one can learn it, but that was left open. In total, we understood that from the point of view of the practice of interpreters, we understood that the role of the interpreters is a very important one in this tripartite uh, constellation between refugee therapists, because only via them communication can function, the therapeutical dialogue can be uh, implemented and can only happen. Thank, Thank you very much, person. Now the next one is Sandra Pertek on safe spaces for therapy. Welcome everyone. I'm very pleased to report back findings on behalf of my colleagues uh, Barbara Wolf, Dr. Barbara Wolf and Cuba Bill Mishoder. We talked about how to create a safe space for therapy and I will just begin from the main discussion points and then takeaways. So first of all, we talked about fostering trust as essential, a confidential, building confidentiality, ensuring safe space and storage of data, ensuring right and interpreter were those items that were essential for building trust, uh, confidentiality, um, not only of the interpret, not only of the therapist, but of interpreter, as my colleague just has related back to you from other from the other group. Uh, it's important to also consider external stressors. Many people may be unable to live in safe conditions. So even though if we have safe space, space in the therapy, people may go back to, to spaces where are unsafe and they might be confronted by a range of different stressors, such as racist attacks that influence their mental health daily. Uh, we need to connect it. It's useful to connect with clients' worldview on neutral grounds uh, to validate injustice injustice experience that was raised by Barbara and to perhaps uh, ad behave as advocates of, of our clients and to show understanding that injustice, injustice suffered uh, shouldn't take place, yeah, regardless of our uh, beliefs and um, world views that we bring to the therapy. There are spaces for connection based on neutral grounds. And then it's important to provide information and not enforce disclosure. So uh, whenever a client feels uh, ready, they should have information uh, where where they can disclose if they are not ready uh, in the therapy then itself. And the client should feel that she or he is in control of the process of disclosure. Gender of therapies and interpreters matters too. Female clients may feel more comfortable to relate to female therapists and interpreters. Some might be restricted to access counseling centers by, for example, male relatives or other practical barriers such as lack of finances to cover bus fares and also or child care and so on. Alternative therapies can matter too, such as, for example, group relaxing methods for women and men in places where it might be difficult for people to access uh, formal spaces, uh, formal therapies, alternative therapies could be, should be explored. And it might be difficult for, uh, when we talk about gender differences, it might be more difficult for men to open up due to prevalent gender norms. And it is important to actively uh, op oppose stigma against stigma around mental health. So, to, for example, we could integrate uh, health messaging into other projects that we are conducting. So it's easier for people to access mental health supports. Main tech takeaways, first of all, ensure internal and external safety. Tuba has emphasized the role of internal safety, inner safety that, we, that uh, clients can, that can take control of by, for example, may, putting some signs, making some signs to, to communicate to therapists that this is unsafe space to discuss or stop therapy, have a break. Safe environment is essential. Um, there's a range of in, um, checklists that, that can help us to ensure safe uh, space is not distracting and is ensuring people um, can open up and discuss without uh, fears. And just to finalize, building trust, again, uh, is essential. This can take time. We need to be patient. Boundaries are needed to help facilitate feelings of safety. So it's important to set these boundaries uh, as, as part of the consent consent that we uh, aim to build at the beginning of the therapy. Psycho education is needed to ensure people know the process and they 
they know what's expected and careful selection of interpreters is obviously a fundamental as it can destroy any therapy efforts. We have heard from Barbara an example of a rape survivor who wasn't able to be disclosed because her interpreter was her son four years and only after she got a you know, competent interpreter she could she could really be in her healing and it has a huge it had a huge effect on her family. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, let's continue now with secondary traumatization. So, Sama, please. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'll try to keep it short. Um, so, yes, we were joined by the session from Dr. Uh, from Dr. Schmelze and Dr. Yasa. Um, so, we discussed the secondary traumatization. So, all of those who are working in the field, you know, uh, for example, uh, therapists, journalists, uh, translators, they need to keep balance between closeness, which means too much empathy, and uh, which and this obviously would uh, might cause like secondary trauma or too much distance or too much distance will alienate the person we are trying to offer help um, and those who are like working in the field and who are familiar with this topic they often like uh, mix two expressions with each other so secondary traumatization which causes symptoms that are similar more or less to those of the patient and uh, Dr. Smith said the translators are especially effect affected here and burnout or uh, what they or what might be called also uh, compassion fatigue and this causes like exhaustion of the body and emotions and this can be caused by staying too long in and too long um, in uh, like uh, too long in uh, contact with emotionally uh, stressful situation um, so Dr. Yasa talked about the risk factors that might contribute to the secondary traumatization. He talked, for example, about personal risks related uh, or like resulting from like stressful situations at home, uh, like uh, caused by relatives, parents, uh, partners, etc. And also professional uh, risk factors um, uh, that might be caused by not uh, like, for example, uh, by a stressful work environment, by not having too much contact with other co uh, colleagues. So what are the main takeaways? Um, so like, let's uh, like focus on how we can mitigate the effects of this, uh, of this so-called secondary traumatization. So first of all, and most importantly, reflect on your own emotions. Don't try to avoid what you experience during your work. Take your time and reflect on what you experience at work. Uh, so secondly, know, accept and set your own limits. Don't over exhaust yourself. Try to keep a good uh, work life balance and also very important, communicate with others and especially coworkers and colleagues who are familiar with this environment. Keep contact with them, communicate with them about all the difficulties and all the like main points you experience during your work and realize when you need help and ask for it. So um, both of them. Uh, both the experts really uh, prepared very informative uh, slides and presentations. So perhaps uh, Al Shark would be kind and share it with you. It was very informative, and these two to three minutes are not really enough to share the content they shared with us. Thank you, Sama for this very concise uh, introduction. Um, well, let's continue with uh, Samyatar and Individual Stories 1, where we, or where the participants heard about the life story of Tahir, I think. Exactly. Hello, everybody. Tell us more, yes. So um, I had a very personal talk with Tahir from Germany. So he's, he came to Germany six years ago and he has some kind of special situation because his family is distributed across three, three countries. His parents are in, in Syria. He, he himself and his brother are in Germany and his sister with her family is living in Turkey. So, and we talked a lot about dealing with ob obstacles, overcoming barriers and problems they had when starting your life in Germany and Turkey, but also problems they have um, until today or they are experiencing 
experiencing even after a couple of years. So, um, but we also talked about processing the experiences um, he had and she had um, when coming to Turkey and to Germany and about going the next step. So um, the main takeaways from my perspective were, so both of them, so the sister and Taha and his brothers, uh, and his brother, they experienced the difficulties in getting started started in, in their respective countries. So for Taha, exam for example, it was especially difficult regarding education and graduation. So um, all his degrees were not accepted. He really had almost to start school from the beginning um, until he really was able to to go to the university and now start um, um, now studying um, dentist medicine. But also he talked about the problem of being um, of being well accepted, uh, uh, well accepted in German in German society. So people really accept him, accepting him him as part of um, of German society. So this was a difficulty for him getting connected. People turning away only because he's Syrian or he's a refugee. So this is something he pointed out. But he also talked about the problems his sister has, and they are at some point even worse. So there are strong barriers between getting in touch with Turkish people, with the Turkish community and getting accepted. And she, until today, um, was not able to go to university, continue her studies. She, st she, she started in Syria or doing a new um, degree. So this led to the situation that she doesn't work um, currently at all. So, um, and he also pointed out people in the majority society forget what Syrian people experienced. So um, that they experienced war, that some of them experienced torture, people in the family and friends died, they experienced violence on their way um, to the country. So they have experience a lot of difficulties and many people tend to forget that. So his biggest wishes for the future, um, we also talked about that, is we pointed out the topic peace, yeah, peace, 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 peace in Syria for his country, for sure for, her, for his parents who also live there and all the children who are growing up there, but also peace of mind. And the other topic is what he wishes is being accepted in Germany as normal citizen, yeah, and he pointed out that um, we all should be aware there are no classes in people, yeah, there are no differences in people, so we start all start from the same point. Thank you, Sami. Very strong uh, main takeaways. So. Well, um, then let's move on to the last one of the um, yeah, breakout sessions to Hannah Atta. I had a very emotional talk. Sorry, uh, Anna. Um, I just heard that uh, there was a technical difficulties with you, a technical difficulty with your translation. So, um, could you say it again? Switch to English, maybe. Yes, yes, I can okay, do it. Okay, thank you. But should I start from the beginning? Yes, please. Okay, uh, I just said I had a very emotional talk with two very strong women. Um, these women were Sirin Said and Shofa Kodesa. Sirin is working for the um, Multicultural Center in Bessel. She is supporting Syrian uh, women um, with different activities like helping her in the daily business, but also activities like um, cooking, dancing, and different stuff. And Soha is one of the women joining her activities. And Soha shared um, her story with us. Um, I'm still very grateful that she did this. Um, Soha had, uh, is coming from Dara in Syria. And um, yes, she has children. She lost one of her son in the Syrian war. And she is here with, with um, her other son. And she still has one daughter in Lebanon who is suffering um, because she was living in a marriage and got divorced. And like it was uh, very emotional because uh, Soha's 
started crying while telling her story because she's just willing to see her daughter again. So in short, what the main points of the discussion were, and this especially Serene shared this with us, that there is no mental health for these people like Sohan, other Syrian people coming here to Germany. Um, and even though Soha emphasized that she's so grateful to be in Germany to get the financial support and other things, um, this point is still missing. And there was a question if it's still but if it's helping Soha to share his st her story with her, and she she confirmed and said it's said it's a, it's helping her. So my main takeaways are first of all not to forget to ask people, even though they're living like like five, six years with us now, still asking them about their story, what what do they going through until now? And also to always keep in mind, even though maybe some of us heard different stories, every story is an in individual story. And in and, and all of these uh, stories and also this mental uh, mental health problems. It's not only about the war because in the end there's still normal people who have family difficulties or who has different topics in their lives, and we should never forget about this. And um, my also main takeaway is, and especially Serene always emphasized that Syrians need mental support in Germany. And one, um, because Soha also repeated herself a lot, that she just wants to see her daughter from Lebanon again. So a uh, first step, uh, it could uh, already could start to help these kind of people just to bring them together to with their families. So this was it from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, I could have listened to all of your stories for for a much longer time. Uh, I think they're really interesting and uh, inspirational stories that uh, you shared and uh, very important aspects that have been mentioned. Um, well, as uh, the, the good news is that um, some of the aspects that we uh, yeah, kind of um, talked about, for example, the, the important work of the Zentrum Überleben um, that was mentioned in, in one of the first um, breakaway uh, sessions um, will be discussed in more detail tomorrow. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, as we're running, as it is tradition, uh, slightly out of time, I would um, like to move now to the last session, uh, and that is uh, shifting. Um, yeah, like the, the, the yeah, the arrival and like between non arrival and uh, arrival in new countries. Um, so, Huria, would you like to start with your presentation and introduce yourself? briefly as well. So. Hello, my name is Hurie. I'm a clinical psychologist at the uh, TRC. For five years, I've been working there. And during this time, when we started offering psychosocial support, in the first place, what has changed? I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. I've sent you a presentation. Will you start it or should I? We will start it here, I think. Just one second. Um, you can... Yeah, start with your presentation. We'll be ready in, in a bit, but just go ahead. There we go. Next slide, please. Well, in fact, Syrians, compared to the beginning of the war and now, um, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. But when we say Syrian, which Syrian are we talking about? Is it a survivor of war 
or is it that they have gone through illegal migration routes or they've been tortured or they have been deported or they have the fear of deportation or they've been a victim of human trafficking or are they a victim um, to something else or have they lost family members? So it depends. I mean, um, not only are they Syrians, but they are human beings uh, with a specific trauma. Next slide, please. But main reasons of application is not being able to sleep or being able to fall asleep late and wake up late or having nightmares, bad dreams, having trouble going out alone, sometimes moving together with the whole family or feeling the urgency to move together all the time, fearing, having anxieties about many things, anger control related problems and suicide attempts. These are some of the reasons for application. Since the very beginning, this is what we have been seeing, but only recently are we seeing more trauma focused applications like I was abused in the past or I was tortured in the past. And this is why I'd like to get psychosocial support, sort of, you know, conscious efforts, especially part uh, after the pandemic, we've been seeing this, but more or less the reasons of application have been like this. Next slide, please. Well, you've skipped one too much. That's okay. Anyway. Okay, as a psychopathology, from a diagnostic perspective, we see a lot of symptoms of depression, PTSD, and anxiety. These are the symptoms that we see, that we have been seeing from the beginning until now, and these have not changed that much. Only PTSD after the pandemic has been aggravated. We're seeing it more and more. I mean, they've had everything on track, but then with the pandemic, the old triggers are back, like about the war or about the trauma some reminders hit back and then PTSD symptoms emerge again. Next slide, please. Now, how has it changed over the years? The applications based on the traumas, for example, those who are sur survivors of war, in the first years of migration, they had more or less trust related issues and they were afraid of the triggers. In 2016, we used to work with children at schools who uh, had just migrated and we made sure we wouldn't be using any balloons in case they, they would explode. And that would bring back some triggers for the children in case the balloon exploded. Or with adults, for example, every time a plane would fly by, uh, they'd be traumatized once again. But now it's more like in survivors of war, for example, when time passes, panic attacks are the reasons for them to come to us. For example, they feel like they're having a heart attack. They feel like they're dying. So anxiety attacks or panic attacks as such make them come to us. So that is the change in the applications that we receive. And also recently we have we have been receiving a lot of applications about social phobia, agoraphobia, um, and also um, hypochondria, fear of uh, all sorts of diseases. And with other Syrians, in the 
first period, when they first migrated, they were dubious of everyone and they wanted to be alone or they didn't want to see anyone um, or they didn't come to us at all. I mean, we do not wait all these people to come to us to receive psychosocial services. We also hold some outreach activities to make sure that the people feel they have the need. And the most resistant group for application are the ones who have come uh, through illegal routes of migration and who have been tortured on the way or abused on the way. But over time, for this group, illegal uh, migrants, the ones who have come through I illegal routes, they come to receive more and more psychosocial support. So that is the change we're seeing. But of course, we work with uh, depression symptoms or um, fears with this group of people. Then those who have been victims of human trafficking. Uh, these people had newly arrived in Turkey and they had anxieties in terms of trusting others and they didn't want to apply us. But now we do have people who apply who were victims of human trafficking with symptoms of PTSD. Now people who have lost their family, this has changed and this is not relevant to the pandemic. People who have lost their families on the migration route or back at home in Syria. Of course, um, these people first have the urgency to find their families. And when they can't, uh, they feel anger about it. And when time passes, they start feeling something of a grief and they are part of the psychotherapy process to deal with grief. Now, when they first came to Turkey, they used to, or they apply for financial help. I mean, even if they come to psychotherapy, they're there to um, convince us for financial support. That was the case in the past. But then in time, they started making applications for their children, psychosocial support for their children. Of course, this is not the same for all people. It depends on the um, educational status and many other things. And then the more um, these services were known in the society, people started noticing uh, their improved well-being. So they have then recommended us to people around themselves, their mother-in-law, sister-in-law, other family members. And sometimes they, they say to us, well, don't let them know that it was me who said they should come, but you go find them, okay? This happens. After the pandemic, we started receiving more conscious applications. I think this has something to do with the fact that our methods had to change after COVID-19. After the outbreak, we tried to reach uh, the people. I mean, people at the community center knew about us, but after pandemic, we started also making active use of the social media channels. Now, this being the case, we started having access to the people we weren't able to access before. And we started receiving more truthful applications. And then the clinical manifestation also changed. I mean, traumas were tri triggered more and more. So I think we've been receiving more applications after the pandemic.
you know, we have some research, we ask for their needs, and we ask the people how the pandemic has been affecting them. And the migrants say that they haven't been widely affected because they have bigger problems, like they have faced death, and pandemic is just like any disease. It's a small thing next to what they've experienced. It's a drop in the ocean, so to speak. But in fact, this being the case, there is a huge increase in the applications and we see the triggering of past traumas. Like with the pandemic, the theme of death is there once again. So the people um, are reminded of the lost ones, of the lost beloved ones, or they have these re remembrances of moments when they faced death. Or with children again, uh, the old traumas are being triggered again. So their reactions towards acute trauma were not present when they first arrived, but it seems like these symptoms are now there, as if the incident had happened now. Next slide, please. Now, in psychotherapy, one important theme is surely transference, that the clients pass on their own feelings towards their um, family members or people around them. For example, they may uh, feel a liking towards the therapist, uh, which resembles the one towards their mother, or an anger that they have for their mother, or a feeling that they have for their father. They may feel that intense emotion towards the therapist in therapy. That's called trans transference. Now, this was the type of transference that we saw. But at the Turkish Red Crescent, there was a transference that they felt towards the Turkish Red Crescent that they transferred onto us too. This may, may be gratefulness. Because we are Kızılay, we are not on an even footing with them. So they are thankful, they're grateful, and they have this... Um, wish to receive financial support, thinking we are Kızılay. And only after some time uh, will they feel, for example, a transference for um, the host country, Turkey. And, you know, let's say they are thankful to Turkey for accepting them, and then they transfer it on to the therapist, like, you're listening to me, thank you so much, I'm grateful to you. Or the same, but in opposite, may also hold true. I mean, if they're angry about Turkey, then they'll feel an anger towards the therapist. They transfer it to the therapist. This is a natural process for therapy. It's not a healthy process, but for example, one of my clients developed COVID last week. And this person was really angry at me for having not convinced them to get a vaccine. I mean, it's not a realistic anger, but this is an example of transference, for example. So with the Syrians and working with Turkish Red Crescent, these are the examples of transference that we often see. Thank you, Uriye. Um can you slowly come to an end so Barbara can start with her? Do you want to, do you need another minute maybe or? Sure, sure, okay, I have one you. more slide. Perfect. So this is a transference. Next slide, please. And 
Let's now have a look at the children. When the children came, come first, they used to have a lot of trouble getting used to uh, the school life because they don't speak the language and they haven't attended school and they've had a trauma. Like if a child hasn't experienced war, they'll be afraid of ghosts, for example, but if they've experienced uh, such a trauma, then their fear will be about facing death. So in terms of the educational system and in terms of psychologists who do child work, um, we had a lot of problems in that regard, but over time they learned the language and this problem seems to change now. Okay, I can stop here. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, we we'll have time for uh, a brief Q&A afterwards. So uh, in case there are questions from the audience, which I'm sure there will be uh, after your really, really interesting presentation. Um, I would like to hand over to Barbara Wolf. Unmute. Yes. There we go. Now, here we are. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Uriel, for your interesting, very interesting and very informative uh, input. Uh, um, I will try to um, add a little bit the situation of refugees in Germany and um, uh, look at the, let's say, the individual career by the during the course of time. Um, but I think it was good, it was very good that you pointed out that there are very different types, different people coming and we always have to consider this. First of all, to my person, just short, I'm a neurologist, a psychiatrist, I'm a member of the board of FATRA, that is a, an NGO that's running a counseling center for 24 years. I'm, also in the board of BAF, that is the umbrella organization of psychosocial counseling centers of refugee and victims of torture. And a part of this, all these, uh, I'd say, overhead uh, work, um, I see clients at our counseling center and I write medical legal reports for asylum processes. So um, if we, took a little bit of look at what I experienced or what we experienced over those 24 years of our work. So it's not only Syrians I'm talking about. Um, what we found out the first, what we see in people when they come to the exile country, the big relief, they survived the flight, they survived the persecution in the home country. And there's great thankfulness that they can stay here. And then there comes this concerns about the ones they left behind. And then slowly, slowly comes the realization of uh, that they're in a foreign country, it's a foreign language, confrontation with a different culture and with all these difficulties like Sumiya Yesia pointed out at the beginning of our meeting today. So they have in Germany, they usually have a roof over their head, they have something to eat, but they have difficulties to get a permission to work and uh, the living conditions are getting poorer, I'd say, because there's a new law in Germany that they can be kept 18 months in the immigration camp or the exception camp. And a part of this, they realize that the traumatic experience they had, maybe they don't call it a traumatic experience because they don't know what trauma is, but they experience that they are still haunted by their uh, memories and their intrusions like Uri just pointed out. And by this time they not already had a first interview at the immigration officer and after some months or sometimes it takes a little bit longer now, a bit quicker now in Germany, they get the first decision. For Syrians, um, the most of them 
don't get a proper asylum, but a three years per stay permission. This causes new problems because they can't get their families to Germany or are not that easy, or very, very difficult. And for others, they are from other home countries, countries of region, they are often not accepted, like till some weeks ago, Afghanistan, for example. So the Syrians hear that deportation is possible in Germany. It's not that once you get here, you are safe. And there are even some politicians who talk about deporting Syrians right now. So the problem of safety creeps into the life, I'd say. I, I would do. And there's always underlying the intrusions and memories of what they had experienced. And then the asylum difficulties start and the difficulties with uh, coping with a new country and the new culture and getting the permit to work, which is very crucial, especially for the for the men or for the fathers or the head of the families to be able to uh, get in the, the living to earn the living of the family and not be relying on the being dependent on the um, <clears throat> on the welfare and this is the time when they usually come to uh, our counseling center and with a whole bunch of problems so it's not only the mental health problems but some most of the times the first thing they say i cannot sleep anymore or I get start getting, I'm getting angry very easily, but I don't want to, or things like that. But they also have problems in their asylum process. They have problems with the job. They have problems with the poor living conditions. They have problems among each other. And all this bunch, that's what we have to deal with. And, um, Yes, uh, we try to give support, we try to give help. The actual trauma-related problems uh, are always underlying. Sometimes we can speak about that, sometimes we have to speak about it with the clients because they have to be able to speak at the court or at the immigration office about what happened to them and they're not really able and uh, so we have to uh, is explain them what happens there and how they can speak about it or we have to find a method that we can report it and give it to the judge and slowly slowly with all the struggle over sometimes it takes years so and then they get a permanent permit for staying, a residence permit, and they find a work and they find a proper uh, living the house where they can live in or a flat where they can live in and get out of the big camps. And the children go to school and sometimes they get a little access to the German society and find friends and all this. And then they leave our counseling, maybe also before, but and then at least then they leave and we experience quite often that years later they call us and come back and said well everything now my life is rather okay it's not as good as it had been in the former country but i'm proud that i managed all that but i still have these problems that the nightmares are still there i'm still haunted by the memories and I still feel guilty because I've survived and my family has not and things like that. And I've, and they tell us they experienced that talking about these problems helped. And now that is the point when a real trauma focused therapy can start. And uh, what I wanted to point out is that a trauma therapy is just a part of support that is needed in, in holistic approach with all the bunch of problems we have to look at is necessary. 
And this trauma-related therapy is often only possible after a long time of rebuilding a new life. And especially you have to, people have to be in a secure situation that you, they don't, they're sure that they don't have to confront the situation in the country of origin again. So, but it's, I hope I'm rather, I kept my time. So. Barbara, thank you so much. Um, yeah, maybe let me start with um, one or two questions from the Q&A. So we are, I think, um, yeah, if we do 10 minutes Q&A, we'll still end on time. Um, so um, my first one would be to both of you, how do you unpack these big packages of multiple problems? Um, yeah, how do you manage to step it uh, to take yeah, to take it by uh, step by step um, with your clients basically? Çıkları var. Aslında insanlar çok güçlüler. O kaynakları bulmak ve o kaynakların el verdiği ölçüde e, onların durumlarına uygun bir sırayla gitmek iyi olabilir. En çok güçlendirmeyle başlıyorum ben. Barbara, can add something to that? Is there a translation or not? <laughs> I didn't understand what Uriya said. Okay. Um, Sorry, I was muted by the host. Okay. Shall we? Um, okay, can you step in then with a quick, uh, yeah, concise translation? Uh, well, no, uh, Huri has to repeat it. I'm going to say it to her. Please do not unmute me. Um, I've uh, heard that you can unmute yourself as well as a chorus, but uh, anyways, uh, Huri, can you um, repeat uh, the maybe the three, four most important uh, aspects uh, so we can all hear <laughs> the translation of them. Although in people's lives they encounter very difficult conditions, people are still strong. They have the resources. Each and every person is very strong. They have a uh, they have the strength in themselves. So I first uh, identified that source. I first empower them, and then based on that, uh, I try to take the channel through which they can make the easiest step into. Well, it's important to collaborate with other programs, but it's risky. It could have uh, a, a negative impact on this. So when I make use of financial means, I should make sure that this does not have an impact on the therapy. So I pay attention to it. Thanks. Barbara, would you like yes, to? Yes, uh, I agree with uh, Huri. Um, the strongest people come. The already depressive, they, I think most of them stay at home. They're not able to go on and leave their country and their situation at home. So we find very strong people uh, and among the refugees. And uh, what we do is, with all this, this big bunch of different problems, we try to find out which is the most most urgent problem and which is the second and we have a good network with for different help what we offer is a psychosocial counseling with a therapeutic background we don't offer financial help we uh, for the uh, legal support we have lawyers and we have uh, legal counseling centers and um, that we work with and um, so we tried um, for severe mental disorders we have psych uh, psychiatrists that we work with who can do medical um, <clears throat> treatment if it is necessary so we try we have a we do the a sort of psychosocial counseling and clearing what is first and what is second, always with a background that we 
consider what happened to these people and what is their problem. Sometimes we have to explain to the lawyer that this person acts in this way because it's tra he, is, he or she is traumatized and um, this is necessary. And so we are sort of in between, sometimes in between counselor and case manager. But for example, we did, don't give financial support, like you said, this is, uh, it's not our thing. So we send them to others, but we try to help to find the right place where they can ask for this special help. The network is very crucial. Thank you. Um, I heard Inga Mattes, uh, do you have a question? Inga Mattes from German Red Cross. Yes. Um, thank you. So can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much for these um, precious insights. I wonder if you have supervision at your centers or do you, because you hear so many tragic stories and difficult situations. So how do you deal with this, you and your colleagues? You can start. Who do you Barbara, say to you? You can you start, start, Barbara. No, who do you start? Yes, we have supervision. We first had peer supervision. Now we have regular professional supervision. This is very beneficial for all of us. And with respect to our own living areas, it's possible to protect ourselves. I travel while I do some sculpture. I'm in contact with animals, so these help to protect me. I try to uh, make sure that I have warm relationships with the, the with the ones that I love. Uh, these are protective for me. But of course, I have started to become a bit uh, or feel a bit hopeless about the world because uh, uh, we work with the worst parts of the world, things that should not happen, the worst things that a war. Uh, introduces into our lives. So this uh, makes us a bit hopeless about the future of the world. Yes, I, I, I agree with that totally. And um, in our center, we have, of course, we have supervision, professional supervision. And uh, I'd like to point out that it is in the guidelines of the our of the buff of the umbrella organization that all psychosocial counseling centers have to have supervision for this work because it's just crucial you just have to have it well any more questions well i don't see any more so then um, let's conclude the last session um, of today, of the first day of our conference uh, with this. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for your presentations, questions, inputs. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll luckily have another day um, where we try to unpack more of the, the questions uh, raised. And um, yeah, especially like, yeah, the the breakout uh, sessions tomorrow, um, especially, are targeting quite a lot of the questions that uh, we tackled today. Um, well, then today, I mean, uh, we looked uh, mostly on the mental effects of the situation of Syrian refugees um, abroad. Um, yeah, common diagnosis, diagnosis uh, crucial aspects of the therapeutic setting. We learned about the community centers in Turkey and um, yeah, this kind of precious uh, space between arrival and non-arrival where many things 
um, yeah, can uh, can be influenced uh, in, in a positive way as well. Um, yeah, tomorrow we will look at uh, the social environment to provide for good mental health. And uh, so, yeah, kind of shift the focus a little bit. Um, that's it for, for now. I would like to thank the German Red Cross and the Turkish Red Percent, of course, for facilitating this. And um, I'm really looking forward to see you all, hopefully, tomorrow morning um, again, but the second part. <laughs>